Hi, today I want to talk to you about nine habits to develop extreme productivity. Now, before you start worrying about this is going to be like intense, don't worry. These, these are, are nice habits that will just help you develop your, your productivity without necessarily working any harder. Just to introduce myself, I'm Charles Kelly, author of the book, Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness. And I, I've produced these podcasts, which are free. I've produced 300 podcasts and I, I'm on Facebook, YouTube channel. So if you do catch me on any of those channels, do like and subscribe. Now, this story here is based on, on a book by Erica and Mike Schultz and their son's five-year fight for life. Now, I'm not going into the whole thing, but their son was born with a heart de defect and they had to spend five years in and out of hospital, spending many, many hours sitting in, in hospital wards, but while still running their business and their home life. So they couldn't just afford to, to stop that because they were in America and you know, if your, your business stops or your job stops, your, your, your medical insurance just stops with it. So they couldn't just afford to sit there and grieve. They had to get on with their work. And they found that they'd become amazingly productive during that time. They even managed to write four books and expand their business. And I've found this sometimes in my life that sometimes my most productive times, my, my most productive seasons have been in times of intense pain or, or uh, adversity or something that really went wrong. And I've managed to come through that uh, with, by, by being even more productive during those times. It, it's just amazing that it sometimes works out like that. Now, during this time when their son was ill, uh, they, they studied thousands of people in jobs and in businesses who were extremely, what they termed as extremely productive, very productive, really productive, however you want to put it. And they come up with some habits, nine habits, based on the use of something that we all have in equal amounts, really, and that's time. We all have 24 hours in a day. Some people use their time better than others. Others waste most of their time, while some successful people will, will use each hour of that time to, towards doing something uh, productive. I mean, I can give you an example of, of during the lockdown when most people binged on Netflix. Uh, you know, some artists and, and, and songwriters actually got out there and, and did something. They, they produced concerts from home. They produced albums. Ed Sheeran apparently wrote 200 songs during this time. And, you know, that, that's just amazing when you consider how successful he is already. He managed to write 200 songs during the lockdown. So let's talk about time. Now, Erica and Mike Schultz have, have basically broken the word time, T-I-M-E, into a mnemonic. And they, they've, they've put time into, into distinct, four distinctive segments. And, and they, they ask you to use those segments during the day. It, it reminds you a bit of Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Successful People, but they put their own spin on that, on this. Now, the first, the first one is, is T, which stands for treasured time. Uh, this is where you, 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 this is cherished time, really, that you might want to spend uh, with your loved ones uh, on a personal level. It's not wasted time. It, it's good time. It's family time. It, it's just time. I mean, in their case, it was spending time with their son at the hospital, uh, but it's, it's what we would call treasured time. The second one is I, it's investment time. And this is the time that generates returns that exceed the work you put in. Notice they say generates the returns that exceed the work you put in. This is not just about exchanging time for money, but it's, it's, it's about maybe doing something where you work once and earn forever, like creating passive income, like uh, spending time starting a business that eventually pays you an income for years and years after, which I've found many times in my life, or maybe time buying a property that then you rent out and it provides rental income, almost perpetual returns forever. And then the M is mandatory time. And these are the, the, the time you would spend doing, during the day, doing things that you must do, like you know, cleaning or uh, cooking or preparing meals or you know, getting your hair cut, whatever it is. It, these are these are things that you you have to do uh, during the day, and then there's E for empty time. This is wasted time. Uh, this is time you might spend just watching endless hours of junk TV or surfing the web, looking at other people's stuff, uh, or just generally doing nothing really. Um, and and this is not this this shouldn't be confused with uh, treasured time. Uh, this is different, and, and, and Stephen Covey actually in nine habit, Seven Habits of uh, Highly Successful People breaks this down as well in a different way, 
and and but but he said that you shouldn't con con consider empty time and, and confuse it with 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 treasure time. Um, treasure time, you you can still do things in treasure time, like watching a movie, but it, but it's not the same as empty time where you're just spending hours just watching one program after another that you you've probably seen before. And, and you know, at the end of the, the day, you've, you've wait, wasted five or six hours, just, just the same as uh, some people are spending 10, 12 hours a day on, on Facebook. Right. So the key message here is that uh, is what, what they've said is to maximize treasured and investment time and minimize mandatory and empty time. We'll need to do those mandatory things, of course, but you can minimize the time you, you spend doing them and definitely try to minimize or eliminate empty time and extremely productive people manage their time better and, and so can you. So, so they put into in place nine habits to become extremely productive and I think you, I could add to that and become happier and, and more content with your life. You know when you're not productive, when you're disorganized, when you, you know you're just going from one thing to the other and been pulled this way and that way, you're not happy and you're not productive at the same time. So the first one they've come up with is recruit your driving force. This is like your why, in other words. You know, why are you doing this? What, why are you here? What, it, what, what turns you on? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Motivate yourself by finding your true driving force. One way you can do this is to write down your goals and then break those goals down into annual, quarterly and weekly goals and man man manageable chunks and tasks. Now, this might sound familiar. Everyone knows that. You've got to write your goals down. But are you doing it? That's the key message here. The second thing is to ignite your proactivity. And this means filling your daily calendar with investment, you know, things that you, you can do in your investment time activities and, and prioritize what they call your GIA or your greatest impact activity. I love this. This your GIA is your activity with the greatest long term return or you know, based on your detailed, concentrated effort. What, what can give you the greatest long-term return on, on the efforts that you're doing right now? What are you doing right now that, that maybe is related to your greatest impact activity? If it's not something that is, is benefiting you in, and giving you a long-term return, then maybe you should consider switching it to a habit or a task that is doing it. So what they talk about is developing better habits to put more time into your GIA activities and to turbocharge really your productivity because that's exactly what will happen. And this reminds you of the old 80-20 Pareto's rule that 80% of your productivity probably comes from 20% of your tasks. It's like running a business, uh, you know, where you're really making the money at the sharp end where you're making those sales. Uh, that, that's where most of your revenue comes in. But a lot of businesses get caught up in all the other things uh, and, and probably waste most of their time with, that they could be spending just on, on sales or it could be on prospecting. It could be sending out those, those email shots. It could be producing those sales letters. Whatever it is, that's the time that generates the most uh, you know, G, GIA, greatest impact activity. And that's what they're talking about. You still have to do the, the mandatory things as well. You still have to do the admin. You still have to process things. But think about what generates the most for you. And then that's the second one. The third one is to re-engineer your, your habits. And this is identifying unproductive habits, such as spending hours on social media or doing nothing uh, on, on your daily commute, for instance. This is in your, your, um, your, your mandatory time, your daily commute. Maybe you spend an hour a day driving to work or on, on a train. And, and you can identify some of the unproductive habits and upgrade them. For instance, could you upgrade your time on social media to learn a new skill, maybe a language, or, or listen to productive podcasts during your mandatory commute time to work uh, to and from? You know, that could be hours and hours a day. And, and as Brian Tracy, one of my old mentors, said, the average person in America today spends enough time in their cars each week to literally study for a degree. So instead of listening to the radio for hours, in fact, he used to say, never listen to the radio in your car. He said, I've never even turned the radio on in my car. You know, now, instead of listening to that, that radio for hours, you know, you could spend that time listening to audio recordings and literally take that degree in three years or, or learn a new language. You know, a degree, when, when I did a degree, I was surprised to, to, to learn that really you could do that degree in 10 to, to 
18 hours per week. Uh, and, and when I did my degree, it was part time. I was already working at that time and running a business. But, you know, you could fit in that time, that 15 hours a week or so. Well, that, that's the time that people spend in their cars. So they could record a lot of lectures. They could uh, download lectures. They could find things on things like Open University and do your degree in your car. Of course, you've got to take the notes and that, and that sort of thing. But there's a lot you can do in your, in your car. So he called it, Brian Tracy called, turning your cars into learning machines. And now, of course, we've got our smartphones and the same thing applies there. And it's even bigger because it, when he was talking about it, it was going out and buying audio cassettes. Remember those cassettes, right? Maybe young people don't know what a cassette is, but it goes into this, this machine in your car. Now you've got your smartphones and your headsets and, you know, you could do this on a train, whatever. Um, and, and now you can access literally millions of audios, audio books on platforms such as Audible. You know, Audible, you pay like one fee... Uh, per, per month and you can download a book a month you know I, I found it revolutionary and there's other other similar platforms as well and then there's there's podcasts you know on every subject at little or no cost sometimes even free like my money podcast it, it's free you know and lots of stuff there is free now that I used to pay quite a lot of money for buying audio cassette things for 50 pounds you know, six audio cassettes that now you can often find on on YouTube and on, on podcasts absolutely free now, another tip is to turn off all those unnecessary notifications on your smartphone and they keep beeping up in your face, right? And then they distract your mind and, and, and they take you away from something that you're, you're concentrating on, right? Or Now, you either sort of switch off those, off those notifications that you don't need or you train yourself not to instantly react to them and press on them and, and then look into them. And then that's another thing you're taking away from. It's taking your mind away from the, the task at hand. So think about that as well. And then changing your environment can also affect your concentration. Maybe where you're working from, maybe your desk or, or maybe you're trying to work in front of the TV or, or whatever it is, um, fix the problem. Work somewhere that makes you the most productive, whatever, wherever this might be. You often see people working in coffee shops, for instance. Sometimes uh, we used to hold meetings in coffee shops rather than at the office uh, because it, it, it meant that we could get away from things and really concentrate on, on what we were trying to, to achieve by holding a team meeting somewhere else outside of the office. It's just about thinking about your environment and being aware of your environment and, and being aware of where you are most productive. And then number four is to obsess over time. Now, obsessing over time means working out where every activity fits into the daily structure, okay? And this sounds you know quite simple really, but just think about making sure that your priorities are reflected in your daily routine. You might say, well, I haven't got a routine. Well, make sure you, you start building a routine, otherwise someone will make a routine for you. Uh, now, the, in, in short, you could say, look, take treasured time, increase investment time, minimize mandatory time, and eliminate empty time as much as possible. Successful and wealthy people, I, I can tell you, value their time and seldom waste their time. You know, if you speak to a successful person, they, they generally won't hang around shooting the breeze for hours just talking about nothing, that they, they're on to the next thing. And I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, I had a, a, a program from John Asaraf. It was one of his early programs. And I think in those days, he used to run courses from his home. And he, he literally recorded this whole course, this mind over matter type of course, and, and put it together on these, on these CDs. It was almost like homemade kind of stuff. And it said, if you've got any questions, call this number. So I called this number expecting to get a team member or some outsourcer, but I actually got through to John Asaraf. He said, hi, it's John Asaraf. I said, oh, it's you. I didn't expect you'd be picking up the phone. He said, no problem, Charles. And, you know, and, and he was chatty and, and he answered the question, but very quickly he, he then said, well, Charles, I've got to, got to move on now. I've got to, got to get on to, you know, I've got a meeting coming up. And, and he politely ended the call. But, and, and I found this also when I met, Jim Rohn and, and Brian Tracy at an event in America. They were very helpful, but quickly and politely moved on. They valued their time. So it's not just about what you do, but it's about what you don't do. And one thing they don't do is waste time. And that leads you on to the next thing, number five, which is to say no. This is really important, learning how to say no. Have a, have a clear idea of what's really important to you. So when someone asks you to do, thing, do something that doesn't fit in with your priorities, have the courage to politely but assertively say 
no. And that doesn't mean saying no to your boss, by the way, and saying, well, the boss is like, I need you to do so. Sorry, this doesn't fit in with my priorities today. No, I'm not talking about that. And it doesn't mean being a, a jerk and saying, you know, no to people who, you know, someone who asks you to, to do something on Saturday to, to help collect some money for charity. It doesn't mean you say no to everything, but it means prioritizing things. Um, you know, so if it's something that comes up and it doesn't you know, serve your purpose at that moment, like from a well-meaning friend, for instance, then you've got to learn to say no or learn to, to not pick up every call from that well-meaning friend who just wants to suck your time up or, or just make you know, unlo- offload their complaints and, and their problems onto you. And they say, well, I feel much better now. Thanks very much. Let's talk to you tomorrow. And you're like, you, you just want to hang yourself, you know. But it, it just means controlling your time. The more successful you become, by the way, the more people will want a piece of you. You know, I found this, uh, you know, as I become successful in business, as I, as I, as I become a counsellor or, or the local mayor, it was the more that people wanted to know you, the more people wanted to, to take your time. It doesn't mean that they're doing anything wrong, but you've got to learn to, to manage your time and your schedule and do what's important for you. And successful people do that. I've noticed this. You'll very seldom find them wasting time. Number six, then, is play hard to get. This is a bit of a play on words, really, and, and it's about concentration. You know, distractions are everywhere nowadays, you know, more than ever, really. And, you know, especially as our inbox is popping things up and, and numerous messages and, you know, you've got Messenger, you've got WhatsApp, you've got this message, you've got that message. And, and you, sometimes you're jumping from one to the other. It's like, oh, my God, there's another one coming, another one come up. So does every message really need to be opened and dealt with immediately? Now, I'm guilty of this. And and I used to sit in my office and and, and I was getting hundreds and hundreds of of emails because everyone wanted something from me in in those. When I was recruiting uh, nurses and staff from abroad, everybody wanted a job. Everybody wanted to to, to get some piece of me. And and honestly, I got swamped with emails and I had to learn to, to get away from that. So, you know, don't try to be available to everyone and instantly answer emails. You know, you've got to, you need to block out time for you to, to concentrate on, on your schedule and the most important GIA task. Your time is your time, right? It's, it's not somebody else's time. So if, you, if you're trying to write that book, for instance, that you've been thinking about for three years, you know, you've got to be able to block out time for it. You're never going to be able to write the book if you keep answering emails and answering messenger messages or WhatsApp or or, or reading that joke and forwarding it on to 10 friends. So to just play hard to get in, in that way. And then number seven is to get in the zone. You know, you know this zone that we talk about with athletes, right? This, the, when you're in that zone, right? Learn to get in the zone and stay there. You can't be in the zone 24 hours a day, but when you need to be, you need to get into to the zones. If you ever notice an athlete or a performer, or you know, sometimes you see people backstage, you know, maybe a half an hour before the concert and they've got people in their dressing room, they're chatting, they're like, I think, how do they do that? You know, they must be worried about the concert coming up ahead, you know, but they seem to, to be able to do that. And perhaps sometimes they're, they're meeting sponsors and, you know, and that sort of thing. But, you know, as soon as they, they get on stage, they're instantly in the zone, right? And they stay there for that two hours of that concert. They're, they're, they're masters of that. And then when they come off, they come down again, right? Now, if you're, if you're worried about getting in the zone, you can't be in the zone all the time. So maybe you might want to set aside a 60 minute work task. Say if you're writing that book, for instance, if you, if you, if you can't get around to doing that book or that report you're going to do for your boss, then maybe say, look, let's set down to 60 minutes, 90 minutes and, and just break it down into short sprints. Say, right, I'm going to do 15 minutes and then take a break. Another 15 minutes, take a break. It's almost like a relay race, right? Or sometimes you call it snack writing. You know, if you have to write something, try try five minutes. So like, put a timer there, not your phone, but a little timer clock. Right, I'm going to write for five minutes. It's amazing. You know, in five minutes, you might get four or 500 words written. So, so think about that. Uh, get in the zone, stay in the zone. And, and by, it's again, it's putting things into little manageable chunks to get, get those things done, rather than that big, enormous mammoth task that you can never seem to get done. Eight is develop energy. Take care of your body by eating nourishing food, getting enough sleep and exercising. Sound familiar? But are you doing it? <laughs> Most people, I mean, take sleep for instance. Most people don't get enough sleep. A lot of people are getting by on five or six hours sleep and then jumping on the train in the morning without breakfast. And, and of course, they're wondering why their energy is going low during the day. Um, you know, find out how much sleep you really need. 
I, I need eight hours sleep. I, I, I can't get by in six and seven hours sleep. And I realized that most of my work in life, that's what I was doing. Uh, I wasn't getting enough sleep and, and I was often tired during the afternoons. So, and, and especially when, you know, uh, the kids were young and you were rushing off to school and, and that's what doing the school runs and that's what, it sounds fun, but it, it was very tiring. And uh, I, I definitely wasn't getting enough sleep in those days, but now I make sure I get enough sleep. I make sure I get enough exercise. After this recording, I'm off to the gym. It's, a, it's an effort, but I've got to do it, you know. Uh, and I make sure I try and eat the right nourishing food, cut out the foods that make you feel tired. I've found that too much pasta and, and bread, I love a good big spaghetti bolognese, but afterwards I feel, I don't feel energetic, I feel sleepy, I feel, you know, lethargic. And, and bread and potatoes, I love them, but they, they, they put on that extra few pounds and the extra few inches around the tummy, and they don't really serve any purpose. Of course, you've got to have some nice, uh, you know, pleasurable food sometimes, but, but realize that, that, that they're not really giving you any nourishment, they're not giving you any value. So just minimize those sort of foods and eat the foods that give you nourishment and give, make, give you energy and make you feel energy, energetic. Now, all the successful people I know and have known and met just seem to have boundless energy. And this, this is regardless of their age and sometimes they've got disabilities as well. I mean, one guy I know, he's, he's well into his 70s, very successful business person, uh, retired from his main businesses, but he, he's got other businesses now and he still has properties and he's always off to a board meeting. And yet he, he's, he seems to have a lot of energy, he's got a lot of strength and energy. And, and he, he, he lets out his house for charity events and he's out there putting up marquees uh, from morning till night. I think this guy is older than me. And yet he seems more, he seems to have more energy than, than 30 year olds, you know. It's, it's just remarkable. And it's, it's part of his, it's, it's not just about his health as well. It's, it's part of his, his mind, his body, his spirit. It's a combination of things and, and being focused on things and, and having a purpose, getting back to that, you know, your, your driving force. It, it's not just about physicality. It's, all a, it's also about your, your mind, body and spirit, as well as just the physical side of things. Um, you, you can feel energetic when you, you, you want to do something. You know, you can feel really tired when, you know, someone says, look, you know, let, let's clear out the garage. You think, oh, I haven't got the energy for it. But if someone says to you, let's go and play golf or let's go and do something that you really want to do, suddenly you, you've, you've got that energy, haven't you? Yeah. And it's, and it's the same in, in life and work. OK. And nine is what, what, what the authors call right in the ship, right the ship. It, it's that old saying of getting the ship back when, when it's, it's, it's tipping over, you've got to right the ship, right? It's getting back on track when life knocks you down. Now, no matter how successful you are, no matter how, many, no matter how rich you are, things can go wrong in your life and knock you off course, right? People with money have problems, just like people with, with, who don't have money have problems. The only thing with, difference with people with money, they generally have the money to deal with those problems. And, and that's why, why I wrote this book. Um, but they still have problems, okay? And, and they can be brought down. So you, and you have to learn, and, and successful people have learned how to pull themselves together and right the ship. And, and you have to do this time and time again because storms come and go. There's always winds and they always blow you off the course. But successful people have learned how to, to get themselves, brush themselves off, as they say, and get back on course and right the ship. So you've got to identify also the bad habits, like ordering that additional beer, another beer, another glass of wine. When you know you've had enough, you know it's time to go home or constantly checking your phone all the time. That can be, that's one of those bad habits, okay? You have, you have to have the, the free will and the free won't, right? This is getting back to the saying no. And as I said, you know, if, if things seem too daunting, break them down, break those large, seemingly impossible tasks into smaller, more manageable chunks. That's a, a very old time management tool. Another thing is you can make a contract with yourself. Make a contract with yourself to achieve something like you want to lose weight, you want to get fit. So look, I'll make a contract with myself that if I go to the gym two or three times a week, then I will uh, you know, donate money to, to, to something that I really want to do. I'll give myself a treat. Or if I don't do it, I'm going to have to donate to a charity I don't like. Okay, um, So you can do all sorts of little tricks with yourself to, 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 to make that little contract to get yourself up and, and motivated. Now, th those are the nine things. I would add to that systems, uh, to, to Erica and Mike's great habits, but I would add also sim systems. Systems are something that makes a difference between 
uh, you know, getting things done and not getting things done. It's, it's like, it's the difference between a small one-man band, mom-and-pop business and a larger, more scalable business, okay? And the difference is, the difference is often just systems. You know, scalable business have systems in place, they have processes in place, even when the owner's not there. And they cover everything from admin to sales. Most small businesses don't, right? That's why they stay small. Now, I've been in the small business. I've done this myself. You know, I've been dashing from this and that, you know. And the owners can never scale up their business because they are in the business all the time. They're 60, 70, 80 hours a week in the business. So if you talk to them about, um, you know, scaling up or expanding, they would say, to you, how can I possibly expand and, and open another branch? Oh, I can't even cope with this branch. I've got enough for my plate. I can't. There's no way I could do that. You know, of course they can't because they're in that business all the time. That's why they can never sell the business. In one of my early po- earlier podcasts, I had somebody on an expert in 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 selling businesses for, for owners. And, and you can't sell a business if the owner is the business. Because if you take the owner out of it, the, the whole thing would collapse because they haven't got any systems in place. They just jump from one task to another. So systems are, are like that. And, and good families and, and good uh, you know, homemakers have, have systems. And you can apply this to your personal family and your business or your work life. You know, efficient, organized households are run on systems. And if you go to a disorganized home with everything in a mess and, uh, and, and people running around like headless chickens, they haven't got any systems. You know? And th- these habits really don't require any, any more work than you're doing now. Okay? Um, and and I, I think you, you can put these habits in place and become more efficient without necessarily doing any more work than you do now. Another thing about systems is, you know, people can, can waste hours thinking, oh, we're going to eat tonight. What are we going to cook tomorrow? We're going to do... Why not just have a set menu? Just say, well, this is my, I, I eat the same breakfast every day. And, and at night, Mondays we have this, Tuesdays we have that, Wednesdays a vegetarian, or whatever it is, you know, have the same things in place. And, and efficient households will, will generally work like this. OK, now, as I said, these systems don't require any work. In fact, once you get them in place, they can be less work than you're putting in now. And it's the same with becoming financially free. As I've explained in my book, people who become financially free don't necessarily work that much harder. They, they work hard, but they're not working as hard as, say, a coal miner or, or someone doing a hard physical job, like digging a road or, or, or a farmer out there on the farm, you know, in, in cold winters and that sort of thing. They're not necessarily working any harder than, than, than anybody else. In fact, they're working considerably less hard than, than many occupations. But if you want to learn how you can become financial free without necessarily working any harder, then click on my link below and I'll put up some free on-demand training which will teach you how to just do that. And, and if you do that, I'll give you a special gift that can help you immediately transform your finances and your organisation in your life just for attending the online training. So click on the link below to watch that. And you know, if you like this content, please like and subscribe and share it uh, to, to put it out to more people. Check, that, check out my YouTube channel, my Facebook pages, and, and all those iTunes and all that sort of stuff. I'm also on Amazon Music now. So, so do check those things out. And uh, I, I cover more, more of these sorts of things also in my book, Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness, which you can find on Amazon. But do look at my free on-demand training to learn how to become financially free without working any harder. Thanks for listening and have a great day.